Thank you. Um, thank you. It's a, a privilege. I'm sorry. I'm going to be putting these off and on. I'm still getting used to wearing glasses. Um, but it's a privilege to be here, and I, and I appreciate the chance to speak to you. Um, as Father said, I, I worked for the Diocese of Oakland, and before that, we were students. I got a master's degree at uh, the Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology, where, where Father also studied. And before that, I went to a couple of uh, other Pac-12 institutions, but we won't name them. But um, none of them were gold and uh, uh, purple or uh, blue, so we're okay on that. Uh, I wanted to start off with, uh, I'll introduce a topic in just a second. I want to start off with this, this picture I found, or these pictures I found, and ask what these people have in common. And we'll kind of get back to this at the end of the talk as well. But uh, kind of the idea, the theme for the evening is what do these people have in common? And uh, as, I don't know who this is. This is the only picture I could find of a Catholic com Newman committee. I don't know if Father didn't know who that was, so... This is all I could find. Uh, this guy you've probably seen. This guy is who? Have you guys watched movies? Do you have time to watch movies? Bilbo. And then this guy, you, you recognize him because of the keys. So that's St. Peter. Um, so we'll come back to that question. But actually, if I do this and say, what do these people all have in common? And you remember, this was way back when he was a, a student, when he was a civilian, before he was ordained. So what do these, all these three people have in common? You have to kind of stretch a little bit, but um, they're all lay people. So the talk is about lay people in the world. Uh, no longer a lay person. Sorry, Father, you've gone on to other things. But uh, lay people in the world, what our vocation is as lay people, what we're called to do, um, really how we can make a difference in the world that we're in. That's why we, we, uh, we had this cute little tree on fire thing here. And we want to start off by, uh, well, I'm going to mention, I'm going to use some uh, uh, apostolic documents, magisterial documents I'm going to quote from. The first two are actually documents from the Second Vatican Council, and then these were, uh, these were encyclicals, I believe, and this was an apostolic exhortation by the Pope. And these are the documents I'll be quoting from primarily. Um, they're all pretty short. If you have time, I know none of you have time, but if you have time, they're, they're worth reading. Um, they're actually very interesting to read. The first one, uh, as you probably know, uh, different documents have different levels of a teaching authority, just like in school. You know, you have your full professors, you have your adjuncts, your postdocs, graduate students, maybe a roommate. And so each one has a different level of authority. And the highest level of authority in the church are these dogmatic constitutions, and that's the document we use the most. And something I found out just a couple years ago is uh, where they get the titles from. Maybe you know this, maybe you don't, but I didn't. The title is actually the first couple words of the document in Latin. So when the Pope writes a document, he has to think, now what would sound good? How could I start this? What's a title that no one's used before? So Lumen Gentium is light to the nations, and that's kind of the, the theme for the night's talk. Uh, this is on the activities of the apostolate, and then these are pretty much translated down below. And if any of you speak Latin or know Latin, you can probably correct it, but that's, that's close enough. So we're going to start off with talking about what is a lay person. And that's kind of the traditional definition. It's kind of a negative definition. It's kind of like saying, well, uh, a single person is someone who's not married, or a man is someone who's not a woman, or a student is someone who's, uh, you know, lots of different things you could say. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not a very positive definition. It's kind of telling what you're not, not what you are. And in 1964, the church actually came up for the first time, I believe, in history, a positive definition of what a lay person is. Lay persons are all the faithful with the exception of the religious and the clergy. Notice this is from the dogmatic uh, constitution I just mentioned. So in other words, since the church is 99.99% lay, we are the, I shouldn't say it, 99%. That's, that's what we are. That's what we do. That's what we make up. And Father Michael Sweeney, who uh, is the president of the Dominican School and who I've, I've worked with since 2002 doing these workshops on lay formation and he worked with Father Mike Phones, who you'll have speak to you in a couple of months or a couple of weeks, I'm not sure. Uh, he points out that we can't really understand who a lay person is by looking at the clergy. What we really need to do is look at the church because we, we make up most of the church. The church is 99.97% lay. So really the question is, what is the church? Who is the church? What is the church for? And I would, I would start off by asking you, what is your experience of the church here at Stanford or back in your home parish, perhaps? What, what does the church do? Your experiences, what are some of the things? This, I'm not looking for anything esoteric, just simple things. 
Like, hint, Sunday, what might you do on a Sunday if you get up? <laughs> Mass, okay, so it's liturgical, all right? What are some other things you might do? Especially maybe during Lent, make a special effort to go to the sacrament of confession. confession, maybe. Okay, so it's sacramental. It's liturgical, it's sacramental. We have ordained, we, have, we actually have uh, bishops and all, so it's hierarchical. And most people recognize all those things. If you were... Pastoring, yes, ministerial, takes care of people, yes, so ministerial, those are four very, very important things. But that's leaving out an important aspect, which, frankly, I had never really thought about, and I've been Catholic all my life, until I heard a talk like this, it was a, it was a better talk, it was a better speaker, but I heard a talk like this about 15 years ago, and that's sort of indirectly why I'm here, it was Father Michael Sweeney talking about uh, Redemptor Hominis. The church exists according to our late Holy Father, John Paul II. He addresses in his very first encyclical, Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of man, exists for this one reason, that every person on earth will be able to meet Jesus Christ. That is why the church exists. And in this document, this apostolic decree from the Vatican Council, it repeats that. It says, it was founded for the purpose of spreading Christ throughout the world. So that is the reason the church exists. So that's the mission of the church. I'm going to give you a couple more quotes just so you don't think I'm making this up. All the activity of the mystical body of Christ is directed to the attainment of the goal of, of announcing Christ to the world is called the apostolate. Apostles are those who are sent. Lay people derive the right, oh, and the duty to the apostolate from our union with Christ through baptism. I know Father's spoken about baptism a little bit. I'm going to speak about it a little bit more tonight as well. This is from a document uh, uh, on evangelization in the modern world. This is the end of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, where Jesus says, go out into the world, preach the gospel to everyone. He says, this is the essential mission of the church, is to evangelize. In fact, he says, it's her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. This is why the church exists. And then one more. It's from a document uh, to the nations. I forget the rest of it. It says, every Christian not just Catholics, but every Christian has a duty of spreading the faith. It is both an obligation and a right. It is a un this is canon law. This is the church legal system. It says, it is a universal obligation. It is binding at all times on every Christian until Jesus comes again. So this is the mission of the church. Because we make up the better part of the church, this is our mission. So I have four points I want to I want to point out or, or, or leave with you tonight, and this is the first one: the mission of every lay person is the mission of the church, and the mission of the church is to bring Christ to the world. Now, if you said that to most Catholics that I know, church, certainly to older Catholics, but but even probably anybody today, you talk to most Catholics on Sunday, this would be a revelation to them. This was a revelation to me. I thought I was just supposed to go to mass on Sunday and kind of not get in trouble and and, and like that sort of thing. But this this idea of evangelizing the world was never taught to me as a cradle Catholic. In fact, it sounds Protestant, doesn't it? Well, there's reasons for that. What are the reasons? If we, uh, we go back to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the Great Commission, and Jesus says, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore into all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all that I have taught you. And we go to the, the book of Acts. In the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Spirit comes down on the apostles. And they were kind of hiding in the upper room, and Peter goes out and he addressed, you know, Peter, Peter ran away when a 12-year-old asked him if he was a Christian. Do you remember that? The night Jesus was killed? This little 12-year-old slave girl asked him, I think you're a Christian. No, no, and he runs away. So now he goes out and he addresses these thousands of people, and it says in chapter 2 of Acts, 3,000 people were converted that day, became Christians. But you go a little farther in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, the first couple of verses, it says, On that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered. Those who had been scattered preached the world, or the world, the word, wherever they went. So this idea of Christians spreading the gospel, not just the priests, but all of us spreading the gospel, is an, is an old, old idea. This is not something new. This is, uh, this is the, oops, I just broke it. I'm learning how to use this. Um, this is the, uh, the Great Commission. This is the end of the Gospel of Matthew. So this is not a new idea. In fact, um, Father Michael Sweeney dug up an old work on liturgical practice, and he said, uh, you know, at the end of Mass, in Latin, the priest would say, ite misa est, and the response is, 
Deo Gratis. And the rough translation until a year ago was, the Mass is ended. And we said, thanks be to God. And when I was a kid, I always thought, yeah, I'm glad it's over. <laughs> but why is that? Did, did any of you ever wonder that? Am I the only one? Seriously, I used to think, yeah, I'm really happy it's over, Father. That was kind of a long sermon. And... <laughs> but no, what the, the, the translation should be, and it's a better translation now, is go, you are sent. It's some kind of Latin phrase, uh, par passive paraphrastic or something. Um, but misa is from the, the verb misere, which means to send. So it means literally, go, there is ascending. We say, thanks be to God. And then in the old days, each person would come up and the priest would say, ite misa es, put their hands on them, and then they would go out into the world. And now we don't have time because mass has to be an hour because, you know, people don't go to church there if it's more than an hour. But um, what happens? We have the procession and the priest walks to the back of the church and he stops there. And we go where? Out into the world, which is where we belong. So this is not a new idea. What happened with the, um, the Reformation was uh, that Martin Luther emphasized the fact that we are all priests, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, and he kind of de-emphasized the fact that there are ordained priests and there are essentially non-ordained priests. I will talk about that very clearly in a few minutes. And so as a reaction to that, in the Council of Trent about 500 years ago, the Catholic Church emphasized the ordained priesthood and kind of, I think, neglected the laity. And we kind of forgot that this was what Jesus told us to do. So this is not a new idea. In fact, I think we still do that today. I think we still may be a little too clerical. We focus too much on the inner world of the church. So let's look at this. Um, yeah, this is another document. Let's look at uh, Lumen Gentium very quickly. This is the outline, eight chapters. And notice, first we talk about the church and all the people of God. And then we talk about the difference between hierarchy and laity. So this is, this is the way the church views it. And I'm going to focus on this chapter and a little bit on this chapter. Bless you. Vatican II has been called by some the Council of the Lay People. Pope John Paul II, in his, in his document in 1985, said the church has written, the council has written as never before on the nature, the dignity, the mission, and responsibility of the lay faithful. This, is, this document is called Jesus or Christ's Lay Faithful. In fact, there was a bishop that said, uh, while priests were aware of their dignity, laity were ignorant of the power conferred on them through the character of baptism and confirmation. Another bishop said, the faithful have been waiting for 400 years, essentially since the Council of Trent, for a positive statement on who lay people are, which, which the council gave. Now, they say something very interesting. They said, Certain things pertain particularly to the laity. What those are are secular. So we hear the word secular, what do we think? I Googled it. Get things like, uh, uh, I forgot what I got. <laughs> Get things like uh, humanist society, uh, infidels.org. Um, but it's actually a Catholic term. We think of secular as opposed to sacred, but actually it's a Catholic term. Secular has to do with time. Secular comes from a Latin word that means age or time. So it's things that are temporal, things of this earth, things that are not eternal. Secular things are things of the world, as opposed to sacred things which are eternal. And in the Middle Ages, this concept of two kingdoms was developed. This was the original separation of church and state. It was not Thomas Jefferson. It was theologians in the, in the Middle Ages, probably Dominicans, um, and said there are certain things properly ordered to God and other things that are properly ordered to the human person. There are sacred things and there are temporal things. What would be the sacred things? What is ordered to God? Well, worship and the human person. The human person is created for God. Everything else is created essentially for us. So things properly ordered to God are these things because worship of God that, that will go on for all eternity and the human person, we will go on for all eternity. We will be transformed, but we'll go on. Everything else is ordered to here and now. And if you read the book of Genesis, when God made everything, he didn't make, well, this is okay and this is not so. Everything God made was what? What's the adjective that he used? Everything was good. Now we live in a fallen world and, and creation has to be restored, but but things that God made are good. So chocolate is good, whether it's Christian or not. You don't need Christian chocolate for it to be good. There are certain things that are good in and of themselves. They're not as good as God, but they are good in and of themselves. So the church teaches us that, that there's two things um, 
Some are ordered to God and some are ordered to the world. And the things that we are particularly interested in are the things of the world. And the church makes this astonishing statement. Pope, Paul, or Pope John Paul II made this statement. Lay faithful are called to restore to creation all of its original value. Mind-blowing. That means Garden of Eden time. Wow, that's what we're called to do. I haven't been doing my part. We share in the exercise of the power with Christ himself. The risen Christ himself draws all things. A very, very astonishing statement. I think this would be amazing news to most Catholics. The apostolate in the social milieu, that is the apostolate to the world around us, the effort to infuse a Christian spirit into the community in which one lives is so much the duty and responsibility of laity can never be formed performed properly by others. So this is our job. This is what lay people are supposed to be doing. You thought you'd probably come here and get a nice easy thing, but we have to transform the world. That's what, that's what Christ is calling us to do. The church speaks for Christ. Now, sometimes we think that um, when I was a kid, I was taught basically to be holy was to kind of withdraw from the world. You know, like monks, they were holy. If you want to be holy, you had to go in a monastery or you had to certainly... Certainly when I was a teenager, you know, I was interested in things of the world. And um, I wasn't encouraged to pursue that. But the church actually disagrees. The church says that, um, oops, I'm, I'm sorry, I, sk I skipped ahead here. My notes are off. Um, church wishes to spread his, uh, spread his kingdom by means of the laity. We have the principal fulfillment of this. But the church also says that the world is the place where lay people fulfill their vocation. We're not called to spend more time at church. That's not what the church... Now, maybe some of us need to spend more time at church, but that isn't the primary thing we're called to. We're called to be active in the world. Because the world itself, it says, is destined to glorify God. So by their vocation, we seek the kingdom of God. How do we seek the kingdom of God? By, by doing lots of rosaries? By coming and talking to Father every other day? By going to Mass a lot, how do we seek the kingdom of God? By engaging in things of the world and ordering them correctly. Have you noticed the world is a bit disordered? You walk outside, you can see it on campus, you read the newspapers, you watch the news. Democrats, Republicans, ah, it's a mess. We're called to reorder things so that they reflect and, and promote the dignity of the human person. That is what lay people are called to do. Sometimes Catholics criticize priests and bishops. They say, you're not doing enough. You, you need to speak out on these things. Well, guess what? It's our job to speak out on these things, not primarily their job. That's what we are called to do. I like this, this quote here. The term secular has to be understood in the act, in light of the act of God who handed the world over to men and women so that we may participate. God gives us the dignity Blaise Pascal said, a famous chemist, God gives us, and famous convert, God gives us the dignity of being causes. What we do matters. And what we don't do matters. And if God asks us to do something and we choose not to do it, it may not get done. He's going to find it. I mean, God's smarter than we are. He can find a way to do it if he wants to, but it won't get done in the way he wanted at the time he wanted by the people he wanted. What we do matters. God has handed over the world to us. So there's been a big shift in the uh, kind of the mindset, at least of the teaching of the church. I don't think it's filtered down very far. So um, I'll come back to this in a second. No, I'll come back to that in a second. So this, this is what I'm going to get to in a minute. I'm going to talk about baptism and confirmation. And this is where we get our commission to the apostolate. But as I was a child growing up, we, the, focus, the focus was to be holy, basically, and to, uh, to be ones who follow the teaching of the church and try to live as good a life as you can. That is still true, but the council has made it very clear that the emphasis for lay people is not on our own personal sanctity, but really on going into the world and trying to sanctify the world, trying to clean up the mess that the world's in. Focus of the church was kind of the care, I think someone said, uh, you said pastoral, was kind of pastoral ministry, taking care of people, and it was almost like, like we were kind of passive, and the priests are the ones that did everything, and 
there's kind of been a, a shift in the understanding, and people are understanding they need to be more involved, but sometimes they spend more time in the parish being involved when really they need to be involved in the world, because the world is the primary place, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. So really, our, our mission is to the world, and the parish, Father, the responsibility of the priest is to form us, to prepare us to go out and do that mission, to give us the things that we need. And the world itself, as I said, uh, was often thought of as a place that, you know, you get too involved in the world, you're going to get, you know, sin here, sin there, sin everywhere. Best to just kind of withdraw. But the church has said, no, the world is the place for lay people. For most lay people, you're going to be actively involved in the world. That's what you're called to do. You're called to change the world by being actively involved in it. So, where does this come from? This comes from baptism. Let's talk about baptism briefly. Effects of baptism removes original sin that we all get born with, except Mary. It imparts sanctifying grace. And I, I don't know how much Father went over with you. He probably was a little more careful. I, I tend to be a little sloppy sometimes when I, when I speak, but he's a Dominican. He's, he's better at that. But sanctifying grace is grace that makes us holy. Grace, grace is a share in God's own life. And we believe that God is, four-letter word, God is Please tell me you know that God is love. That's, that's the core aspect of who God is, right? He's a trinity of persons. They all love each other. I mean, it makes sense God would have to be more than one person, right? You can't have love with just one person. So it kind of makes sense that you have to have at least two. Anyway, God is love. And grace is a share of God's life. Literally, grace is a share of love. And it allows us to overcome the effects of sin in our own lives. So we get sanctifying grace. That's for us. We get charismatic gifts, which Father Mike will talk about. Those are gifts to use for others to build up the church. And it imparts a character. Baptism imparts a character. So since this is a Dominican endeavor, I had to get one quote from St. Thomas. St. Thomas says, you can look this up, Father, uh, in the Summa, third part, Article 63, number 2. He says that character is a power. It's an ability to do something. And the particular aspect we're interested in is this character. Each of the faithful is given or deputed to receive or to bestow on others things pertaining to the worship of God. In other words, we are to bring to others the ability to worship God, to call them to Christ. So the life of the Christian is always directed towards others. Where is the other place? Oh, consecration. Oops, I almost forgot that. That's important. Consecration. Consecration is done on the forehead. It's done with chrism. Chrism was used in the Old Times, in the Ancient Testament, the Ancient Testament, Old Testament, to ordain or to set apart. Consecration means set apart for something special. Set apart priests, prophet, and kings. And when we are consecrated, we are consecrated as priest, prophet, and king. I'm going to talk about that a tiny bit, and Father's going to talk about it more in another talk down the road. But we're set apart. And it's done on the forehead, just like in the ancient days of Rome, when you were a soldier, they stenciled or probably didn't stencil they probably branded you on your forehead so that you could they could tell what army you belong to or what what group you belong to so if you tried to run away it's right there so we are marked in baptism with the sign of christ with the cross we are we are soldiers for christ um, we're consecrated for as i said for mission for witness all the baptized participate in this we participate in the priesthood of christ i'm going to talk about priesthood in just a second so the second point I want you to remember is, first of all, that we are called to change the world. That's the mission of the church. That's our mission. Second of all, the vocation comes through baptism. It's not delegated to us. It's given to us by Christ himself. We are consecrated as priest, prophet, and king. And I'll talk about each of those in just a second. What does confirmation do? It confirms the fact that we're already consecrated. Kind of like, now most of you guys aren't old enough to remember film, are you? used to be in the old days, you'd take a picture, you'd have film, and then you'd have to develop the film. The picture was already there, but you had to get it developed. You've heard of it, I'm sure, in your history books. Well, that's kind of like what confirmation does. We've already got the, you know, the basic stuff, but confirmation brings it out. It was a negative. Negative, yes. Thank you. Well, yeah, let's not go there. <laughs> it's an analogy. It's an analogy, yeah. So it perfects and strengthens <laughs> baptismal grace. It, it, not, it associates us more closely with the mission of the church and helps us to bear witness. Confirmation is ordered to witness. This is also from St. Thomas. By confirmation, how many of you have been confirmed? <laughs> Guess what? You are true witnesses of Christ, strictly obliged to spread and to defend the faith. And this is a spiritual battle. 
There's a lot of martial or military uh, language that's used when they talk about confirmation. Uh, this is a bishop in the early uh, years of the church. Confirmed for battle. St. Thomas Aquinas, spiritual combat. And then we can contrast the Christian with the pagan. I heard this the other day. Pagan actually comes from a Latin word which has as one meaning a non-combatant. So you have the Christians who are spiritual battle, and then you have the pagans who are the... So we don't want to be pagans. We want to engage in this, in this, in this war, in this endeavor. So the catechism says we become priests. With baptism, we become priests. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people set apart from scripture. And the catechism says we in this priestly, prophetic, and royal office. Office is a, like a task or responsibility given to you for others when the church speaks of office. St. Augustine says we are all priests. There is one priesthood, and that belongs to Jesus Christ. And that's what Martin Luther focused on. He focused on the fact that all baptized Christians are priests. However, there are actually two priesthoods, and this is what Martin Luther ignored or disagreed with. The mission of every Christian is to go into the world and convert the world, to bring the world to Christ. That's ad extra, to the exterior, to the outside. Some people are called to focus not on the world, but to focus on the church itself, on the members of the church, and to care for them. They're focusing ad intra, to the inside. And that's the ministerial priesthood. So we have two priesthoods. We have the royal priesthood, or the common priesthood. It's called common, because most people that are Christians have it. And then we have the ordained or ministerial priesthood. And they are focused on the care and feeding of the church. So that's kind of the difference. Their primary responsibility is no longer to the world, although some of them may be sent as missionaries and so on. But most of them are, are focused on, on pastoral care, care of the, and education and formation. That's their responsibility. So we can see that the ministerial priest is actually at the service of the common or the royal priesthood. They, they exist to serve us, not to cook us dinner, but to take care of us spiritually. Bishops, even more so, are supposed to take care of their priests. And the Pope is called the servant of the servants of God. Who do we have here? We have Jesus Christ, the King, the Lord, the head of the church. And what's he doing? Can you see? He's washing the feet of one of the apostles. Back in the day, the apostles and others were not driving Priuses and Lexuses. They got around on foot and on animals. What do animals do as they walk along the road? Poop. Poop. What do you get on your feet as you walk along the road? Poop. What was the king, the Lord, the Son of God doing? Washing. What was he washing off the feet of his apostles? Poop. Servant leadership. I'm going to briefly talk about this. Again, Father's going to talk about this quite a bit more. Priest, prophet, and king. What do priests do? Priests offer sacrifice, whether they're any kind of priest. That's what they do. Obviously, the ordained priests offer the sacrifice of the Holy Mass. We offer the sacrifice of our lives um, in the day-to-day -day world. And, and the, the language of the church is that we, we bring the world to Christ through the Mass. He's going to explain that better, so I'm going to just go on to the next, next one. Prophet. What does a prophet do? A prophet speaks the truth and calls others to hear, to respond. The ordained are given the, the formal magisterial teaching office. They are to faithfully transmit the word of God and interpret it for us. We are also, however, supposed to pass on the word of God. And again, Father's going to get into this a little bit more next time. But I would say this is where the secular aspect becomes pretty important because there are places where only... Lay people are going to be, priests, even if they showed up, probably wouldn't, no offense, probably wouldn't be welcome. When was the last time you were out clubbing in your habit, Father? <laughs> For instance. But we go to places like that. Maybe you don't, but, you know, I'm still young and cool, so I... Um, we do stuff like that. We're out, we have our little startup enterprises. We have roommates. We have apartment mates. We have all these things that we have in the day-to-day -day world, and we are able to... Get the word of God out in a way that priests can't get to. This is where I want to talk just for a minute. I'm going to back up. Talk just for a minute about the new evangelization. I'm just going to throw this out there because this is the year of faith. And in October of 2012, there was a big synod. All the bishops, all the bishops, many bishops, about 50, 
uh, on the new evangelization. The new evangelization is something that, and I'm going to come back to this in a sec. The new evangelization is something Pope John Paul II started talking about almost from the beginning of his pontificate. He was ordained in 1978. He said, we need a new evangelization in these day and times. We need something that's new in methods, that gets the word out in a way we haven't before, new in enthusiasm, new in expression. And that's where I think lay people have a particular edge. We, or we have a, a kind of a specialty, as it were. We can get the word out to people in a way that priests can't easily do because we, we're in different situations from them. So in a way, you can think of it as the priests and the ordained are supposed to give us the word faithfully, and we are supposed to apply it in our particular situations because we all have different situations. Father, you were, what was your undergrad degree in? Okay, so if we're in the world of business, most priests don't have, no, none of the Dominicans have a business degree. You guys are all terrible at business. Um, they are. Yeah. <laughs> so in the business world, priests are not going to be giving you directions. I mean, they can give you ideas about the principles, but, you know, is this, is this enterprise I want to start off? Is this something that's going to build up human persons, or is it going to tear them down? Is it ethical? Is it not ethical? They can give you the principles, but you have to figure out how to apply them. This is just an example of how we do this in the world. This is also covered a lot in the document, uh, The Apostle of the Lady. If you want to read that, it's a, it's a short document. Um, okay, sorry, lost my place here. Um, one of the biggest surprises, well, I'm going to skip that. I, we're, we're, I want to make sure we have enough time. So the new evangelization calls for people who can speak the truth about Christ in a new way to one's peers. So that means, again, your housemates, your roommates, your classmates, your business partners, your professors, grad assistants, whatever. Um, Father Robert Christian, who's the head of the uh, Angelicum, which is the big, big university in Rome for all the Dominicans, says that, of course, because he's a Dominican, preaching in the liturgy and the mass is most important. But he says preaching occurs elsewhere, it occurs in families, business, social parties. I have a friend... Um, who said that she was at a party one time at midnight. She said it was getting a little too intense. People were doing a little too much drugs. She said I, she went out in the, in the garage just to kind of cool off. And she said about 10 minutes later, there was like 15 guys out there. Now, she's an attractive woman, but they, they were all talking about the church at a party at midnight, New Year's. That's her particular thing. We're formed to be contemplative and articulate. Again, that's what Father, Father uh, Isaiah, Mary, and Father Nathan are responsible for, for forming, you, for forming us to be articulate representatives. Finally, king. King does not mean giving orders. Remember, Jesus is the king. He didn't give orders. He served others. So because of our secular nature, we are called to king. The, the kingly office is not to give orders. It's to put things in order. Priests are responsible for the correct ordering of their diocese, or excuse me, of their parish, bishops for the diocese, to make things run well so that you get what you need. We are responsible for making the world run well. Engaging in temporal affairs and ordering them to the will of God. So that, for example, advertising promotes human dignity. Business practices promote human dignity. Hollywood promotes human dignity. That's our job. We have the principal role in the overall fulfillment of this duty. I'm trying to give you some concrete examples. Let them, us, by their competence that priests don't have because they aren't trained. We're competent in secular affairs, computer science, business, biology, all those different aspects. Remedy the customs and conditions of the world if they are inducement to sin. Is the world an inducement to sin? Just get up in the morning and open your eyes. Lust, pride, greed, all the, all the biggies, they're all there. I don't know what Lady Gaga represents. I just threw that up there. <laughs> um, so this is, this is a good place to mention vocation. And I'm just, I'm, because of time, I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. Um, Vocation comes from the word vocare, which means to call. We are called to something. All of us as Christians have a primary vocation as Christians, and we receive that through the sacrament of baptism. That orders our life. Living as a Christian is different from living as a non-Christian, and especially now that we know we have to fix the world. Then we have sort of a secondary vocation or state of life. 
state of life typically has been thought of as either marriage or holy orders. Now, there's a huge, huge percentage of single people in the Catholic Church today, not just in their 20s and 30s, but in their 40s, all the way up and down. So there's, there's some discussion about whether that's actually a, 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 a legitimate state of life or not. And that's a long discussion, which we won't go into. But state of life typically is thought of as marriage or holy orders. And again, you are consecrated. Either you're consecrated to that one person or you're consecrated to the whole world when you're a priest or religious. You're set apart. It orders your life. The third one is perhaps the most interesting. Here we have young Luke. This is not conferred by a sacrament. Again, Father Phones will talk about this more. It's the sum total of everything you bring to the table. Your genetics, your environment, your will, your interests, your talents. What bores you? What interests you? Every one of you is absolutely unique. There will never be another person in creation before you, or never was, never will be, isn't now. Even if you have an identical twin, there, there's little differences. Um, I used to do molecular biology, and back then the scientists estimated there were 25,000 genes in the genome. Maybe some of you know better about now, but that means there's 25,000 factorial combinations. <laughs> That's a big number. So we're all unique, and God is calling each of us to do something that is absolutely unique, and no one else can do. And if you don't do it, as the saying says, it won't get done. St. Teresa said, God has no hands but our hands, and no feet but our feet. Ordinarily, God works through human agency. I'll give you a couple very quick examples. One, um, Sherry has a friend. This woman wanted to be a missionary all her life. It just never worked out. She tried all these things. And finally, she gets married, has a couple kids, and her husband gets posted to Saudi Arabia. Well, she's a married woman with a family. That gives her access to talk to other married women in the Arab culture that are not Catholic that have families. She's now a missionary. Not overtly, because it, it, at least at the time she was there, that was punishable by, by, I think you went to jail. I don't think they whacked your head off. Maybe they did. But she's able to do what she's always wanted. That was what was in her heart. And now her life circumstances have given her that ability to do it. Another quick example. There's a, a person I know gift of music, and he felt himself really called to go play music in hospices for people that were dying. So they had something beautiful as they left this life. Completely different, but, but those are unique things. Everybody's different. So point three is that we each have a personal vocation. Father Mike will talk about this a lot more. I'm sorry, I'm just rushing through this. I, I don't have a whole lot of time left, so I'll keep moving. So priests are educators. They must see to it that we develop our own vocation, that we understand what our own vocation is. Hierarchy, priests and bishops, and I keep pointing over you there because Father Nathan's hiding, should promote the apostle of the laity. Priests should focus their attention on... Now, this is not done in most places, by the way. I think you're, you're in a unique situation. I think you're much, much better than most parishes or, or Newman centers I've been at. In fact, the master of the Dominican order about 10 years ago wrote a letter, 15 years, to all the Dominican apostles in the Western province and said, we need to be houses of formation. One of the few members of the hierarchy I know that's actually doing what the church... And I know priests and bishops are busy, but this is, this is what the church says they should be doing. Bishops are called to acknowledge the essential and irreplaceable role of the laity and enable them to carry their apostolate out. Bishops opt to be engaged in forming an increasing number of laity who can collaborate. You collaborate with your peers. You don't collaborate. Delegation is when you're here and they're there. Collaboration is when you're on an equal basis. Father Isaiah, Mary, and I are on an equal basis. He's ordered to doing certain things. I'm ordered to doing other things, and we can work together to collaborate, or any of you can work together to collaborate. That's, that's, that's still being worked out, but that is, that is what the church is calling us to do, to collaborate. And uh, Benedict XVI says he thinks that's the secret of the new evangelization, is the hierarchy and the lady working together to collaborate. Because we have an irreplaceable task in daily life. This is our specific task, as he says. Okay, oops, it's not there. I have a couple more minutes. I'm getting done. So... For 2,000 years, Western culture has been based on a Judeo-Christian ethic. We can't draw any conclusions, but I would say there seems to be a determined effort to rid ourselves of that ethic, at least in the West. The Holy Father said, the split between the gospel and the culture, you know, the, the Judeo-Christian ethic and the way the culture is, is the drama of our times. These are just some areas. We could talk about any of these probably for hours. Freedom. What is freedom? 
Is freedom meaning I don't have any restraints, or is freedom mean I'm able to do what I'm called to do? Truth, is there truth? Is there absolute truth? Are there things absolutely true or not? You, I'm sure you get in these questions in your philosophy classes or some of your other classes. Materialism, we could say consumerism, you know, just as rampant consumerism, more things. The guy that dies or the gal that dies with the most toys wins. Is that true? Scientism, is everything reducible to material things? Is there anything that's real, that's true, that's important, that is not in the realm of science? This radical individualism, especially on the west coast of the United States of America. This is the most radically individualistic culture in the world ever. And I come from Seattle. It's kind of the same up and down the coast. Uh, morality. What's moral? What's immoral? Is there abs are there things that are always wrong? What is the nature of the human person? Huge question as we get into bioethics and we get into any kind of ethics. Sin and forgiveness. This is interesting. I have a friend who's a convert. He says the coolest thing about being Catholic is he knows he can go to confession and he knows his sins are forgiven. We know that God forgives sins. But he knows you know, if you're not Catholic, it seems to me, he says in his mind, he'd always say, well, was I really sorry? I know God will forgive me, but was I really sorry enough? We know as Catholics, our sins are forgiven. That's incredible. Most of us probably don't think it. We just take it for granted. It's an amazing thing. So if we have guilt about something and we're not Christian, we don't, we don't know what we can do about this. This is an incredible gift that we can offer. Everyone wants to know, what, is it, what does it mean to be happy? How do I become happy? And, and Cardinal Ratzinger, just before he became the Pope, said, we have Christ, and we have all the other pathways that the world offers us. But he says, unless, the, unless Christ is on the pathway, all the, world's, uh, all the roads offered by the serpent are going to lead ultimately to our destruction, because he's not interested in us. The only pathway to, to communion, or the only pathway to happiness is communion with Christ. The, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, what is the first word in every Beatitude? Blessed, or depending on the translation, happy are those who blah, 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 blah. Not, yeah, they'll get to heaven. It'll be boring, but they'll get, no. Happy, happy are those. That's what Christ calls us to. He wants us to be happy. So, this is what evangelization is. Showing people the art of living. What does it mean to be happy? Jesus says, I will show you the path to happiness. I am the path to happiness. It's not about morality. A lot of people think Christianity and Catholicism is about following a set of rules. It's about a relationship with Jesus. This is what most people think the church is like. I, I just run into this. They think it's a bunch of old guys saying, no, 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 don't do this, don't do that. You guys saw that movie, right? Happy Feet? Didn't you see that? Anyway, maybe you didn't see it. That's not what the church is. It's not a bunch of people saying, don't do this, don't do this, and for God's sake, don't have fun. No. Oops. The church does not impose. The church proposes. It puts forward. It says, look, this is the path to life. Look at it. See if it works. Try it. None of you would try to fly, uh, fly a jet airplane or you know, use an electron microscope without at least reading the manual and probably some training, right? Well, the human person is far more complex and wonderful. The psalmist says we're fearfully and wonderfully made. So let's look at the manual. Let's look at the instructions. The church kind of has this, the way I think of the church is we're standing on the corner yelling, you're going the wrong way to the world as it goes by. And sometimes people listen, sometimes they don't. But it's not we're trying to force anything. We're just saying, this isn't going to work. We've got something better. This is a movie clip, which um, because of time and because the uh, sound thing is, I'm going I'm to skip this. So the gospel has to be proclaimed by witnesses. We're called to be witnesses. Kind of winding down here. People listen most of all to your personal testimony, even, even more than any authority. We, that's, just, that's just the nature of, of, of people nowadays. We listen to t witnesses more than we listen to teachers. So we're all called to be witnesses of the gospel. This brings me to one of the last points, which is um, chapter 5 in Lumen Gentium. It's the universal call to holiness. And there's this great book, which I don't have with me, by this man, Peter Kreft. 
It's called Winning the Culture War. And I'm just going to go just a couple points very quickly. He says, you need three things to win the war. And I would encourage you to go listen to the MP3 file. It's, it's, it's a very good talk. You know, listen to it while you're jogging or something, going around the dish. I don't know. You need to know you're in a war. Well, that's pretty easy. You need to know who the enemy is. And then he goes through this list of people. We think, you know, who's the enemy? Who's against Christianity? You know, Hollywood, musicians, politicians, Baltimore Ravens, um, whatever. And he says, no, it's none of those. He says, the enemy is Satan, the devil. That's the only enemy. And he goes, oh, wait a minute. There's one other enemy to Christianity. He says, us. Sin means doing the devil's work, damaging God's work, and we do this. The only reason the devil can do his work in the world is because we do his work for him. God will not allow him to do it without our consent. So we sometimes are on the enemy uh, side. And then the third thing, which is the most important, he says, how do we overcome the enemy? There's only one answer. There's always been one answer. We know the weapon to win the war. We know the weapon to defeat the enemy. We have to become saints. We need to try to become holy. Holy comes from the same word as whole or complete. We want to be complete persons. We want to be whole persons. We want to be the persons God made us to be. To be a saint means to love. That's all it is. It's very simple. It's hard to do, but it's very simple. I guarantee you it's not boring. Trying to love somebody that you can't stand, but it's not boring. Cardinal George, who's a famous cardinal in Chicago, once said, you will never evangelize what you do not love. So that's the fourth point I want you to remember. The key to living a vocation is to seek. None of us are going to get there in this life. But to seek personal holiness, to try to be better people. So I just, just a couple more slides here. So the principles of new evangelization. We need to seek Christ. We need to know Christ so we can share Christ. How do we get to know him? Through prayer, certainly. Through the sacraments, especially the sacrament of confession, perhaps. Community. Through your community. You've got a great community here. You've got great leaders here. You need to rely on each other. You need to support each other. It's hard to be a Christian. The world is pushing back. You need to support each other. It's really important. Um, yeah, it's hard to stand up for your faith, you know? That might mean challenging your roommate about his or her drug use or overuse or their pornography use. Or maybe it means talking to the person that nobody wants to talk to and inviting them for a cup of coffee or just talking to them for two minutes. Or maybe it means um, dragging your roommate to church. Or maybe it means getting up yourself and making it to church on Sunday. The title of this document is Lumen Gentium. It means light to the nations. And sometimes we look around and we think, gosh, the world is pretty dark. I don't know. My little light is enough. But I, I, I guarantee it is enough. This is an experiment you can try. You can go in a dark room, flip on the light switch, Light always pushes back the darkness. It's never failed. I've never seen it fail. Light comes on, darkness gets pushed back. But you need to support each other. Um, follow your heart, that means what gets your attention. Maybe you feel like, gee, I should, help. I should be helping the people in East Palo Alto. Maybe that professor is struggling. Maybe I could talk to him or that grad student that you're working with. Be informed, that's what you're doing now. And share, just be honest. Share with each other your experiences. God will send people to you that, have, that need what you have to offer. A couple more quotes. Oh, so what do these guys have in common? Guys, persons. Um, they're all called to an adventure. Christianity is an adventure. I mean, did, did you see The Hobbit? What did Bilbo say when, he, when Gandalf says, adventure? He goes, oh, adventure. It's like, geez, don't, don't talk to me about an adventure. This guy just wanted to be a fisherman. This little tiny town, he just wanted to keep his wife and mother-in-law happy. And Jesus called him to adventure. This guy, well, um, he gets to work with you. He probably never thought of that when he was going through his discernment. This person, I don't know, but she's called to an adventure too. Christianity is a great adventure. That's what we're called to. Any, I don't know who that is, sorry. A couple more quotes. There's a particular urgency for the action of lay faithful. And I think this is even more true than it was written. This was written in 1985. I think it's even more true in 2013. It's not permissible for anyone to remain idle. We have to do it. We have to do something. And St. Paul, if I fail to preach the gospel, woe to me. Because people need what I have to give them. We can't keep this to ourselves. We have the gospel of life. I'm going to read you this short story, and then I will be done, because I know I'm over time. 
I, I read this. I did a workshop with Father Sweeney in Kansas one time, and this was in the bolt, and I liked it. Upon his return to heaven, Jesus was welcomed by a host of angels. The angel Gabriel approached him and said, Master, now that you're home, what is your plan for continuing the work you began on earth? Well, I left Peter in charge. I told my disciples to wait in the city till the Spirit comes. Then they will have the power and the motivation to be my witnesses all over the world. Peter, Mary, James, Martha, John. They will tell others about my mission. Those people will tell others, and soon the whole world will know about my love. Gabriel looked kind of skeptical. He says, well, okay, I know what people are like. What if Peter denies you again? What if James and John start arguing again? They can't get along. What if Mary and Martha just give up? They run away. What if people run away when they start getting persecuted? I think you need an alternate plan. Jesus says, no, I'm counting on them. I'm going to build my church on them. They are going to be the ones to feed the hungry, clothe the needy in Jerusalem. They, will the ones that be, they are the ones that will befriend the outcasts in Samaria. I will, build, I will write injustice and bring peace to the world through them. I will save the world and build the kingdom of God through their words, their actions, their character. I told them, you are my body, you have my spirit, you will do greater things than I. Those are quotes from scripture. Gabriel was still concerned and said, Master, perhaps you should have made other arrangements just in case. What's your backup plan? Jesus said, Gabriel, there is no other plan. Thank you.